OK, cool. I think uh, I can start sharing my screen. Just let me know, guys, if this is visible to you and I'm audible. Can someone confirm if my voice is audible? Go back in, sorry. Uh, yes, it's audible. Yes. All right, perfect. All right, guys, so without further ado, uh, let's get started with the session. It's uh, not going to be a very heavy, um, let's say, intensive session. It's going to be more of an introductory round for this webinar. Uh, I intend on closing. Uh, we have we have the hour book for this, but I intend on closing um, before that. So we have some time to get around to questions and uh, any comments or questions you might have right towards the end. So a very quick, brief introduction. Uh, I am Abhinav Guha. Pleasure to meet you all. Uh, I'm coming to you live from uh, the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, Dubai, in Ingram Micro. Uh, I work mainly as a solutions architect, and I work closely uh, building solutions, um, vendor agnostic solutions, as well as uh, certain vendor partnerships. And my main focus currently, at least for the rest of the year, is uh, on uh, intelligence, threat intelligence, as well as privacy. So this is kind of what um, I'm not going to be covering the threat intel part of it uh, with regards to this session. It's going to be more in line with um, uh, the Internet of Things. It's going to cover a bit of privacy issues and challenges that we face on our day to days and kind of the landscape where we've come in the last, let's say, a few decades, let's say three to four decades and the uh, evolution of the policies, practices that have gone on in this time and kind of the technology landscape and where we stand uh, at I IoT and what are the current challenges with cybersecurity in relation to IoT. Right, so this is going to be uh, at a very high level the agenda, three main topics. So I'm going to be covering um, IoT, what IoT is, certain examples of it, uh, moving into the variable, wearable tech industry, your Fitbits, your smartwatches, and so on and so forth. And finally, um, this is going to be an ongoing thing, so don't don't think of it as, as distinct chunks. Uh, it's going to be um, covering all these three to topics from a holistic perspective. So you'll see slides in between as well that speaks about securing the IoT. Uh, and finally, I'd like to close uh, with the main kind of the, the overarching challenges that we have with privacy. And that'll be that'll be it. That'll be the the uh, crux of the session that I have planned for you guys today. So let's start. Uh, what is the IoT? It's nothing but a heterogeneous set of devices that is connected to the internet. So think of your Fitbits, your smartwatches, your uh, any kind of wearable tech, any kind of wireless devices that that kind of. Um, send and receive uh, signals and have a direct connection to the direct or indirect connection to the to the internet so in the event uh, that we're that we're talking about your smartwatches it could be a direct connection to your 3g or, or your or your data plan that you might subscribe to or it might be in the event that you're that you're just using it um, uh, primarily for for your own uh, private use being synced up with your phone however your phone does have a direct access to the internet so any device that is on the internet or internet adjacent, let's say, and has the ability to collect data and do some uh, analytics behind the scenes and come up with some intelligent automation and come up with some intelligent insights on the data being collected would be considered an IoT device. Uh, and, and very basically, the, these, these devices have the ability to send, uh, sense, transmit, analyze, and take action on these uh, said data patterns. Uh, and as uh, the title mentions, I, I would be covering every now and then a couple of slides uh, to cover the privacy component, how it all relates to the grander scheme of things, how the dots can be connected. So I'm going to have this little red text section called um, the privacy component, and I'm going to be elaborating on exactly how this relates to, uh, to the specific slide. So in this one, it's uh, organization-wide collaboration and coordination. So as we have an influx, a, a growth, just a boom in, in technology and IoT devices, uh, it is our primary concern. Anyone working in the industry and anyone working in IT 
OT, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, any form of technology really, that this has a direct impact on our lives. And we should be at the forefront of um, having these conversations and driving this change forward. Uh, the likes of GDPR and, and the new privacy laws that are in, uh, in act currently is going to be covering most of this. However, I'm going to be talking at, at, at a very high level, just talking about starting the conversations and having these discussions internally in your organizations and having the conversations with management to make these practices happen. So what could this mean? Um, we have, uh, I previously worked for a healthcare startup which, which uh, aimed primarily at doing this, the Internet of Things for Healthcare. You would essentially, the idea was to have a wearable of a Fitbit or a sm smartwatch of sorts, or, or just, just uh, um, a chip, an IC chip that could be um, stuck onto your, your uh, wrist or your arm, something that collects and senses your biometrics, your, your physical data and keeps a track on this and keeps uh, maintains a baseline and uh, has exactly the, the insights onto what the anomalies might be, an increased heart rate, um, uh, increased blood pressure, so on and so forth. And th this would have a direct contact, direct connection with your smartphone, which of course is connected to the world, as you know. Uh, and this would all fit into the ecosystem of, um, uh, let's say the healthcare blockchain kind of, Kind, kind of a, a decentralized movement towards healthcare. We have a lot of this currently in practice as well with Apple Health and so on and so forth. Um, so the entire idea behind this is that if and when you are at, um, let's say, a health crisis, it could be a cardiovascular disease or or an accident on the road or, or, or so on and so forth, um, you would have a direct access without you having to intervene you would have access directly to the um, to the services, to the healthcare services, and you would have an ambulance on site taking care of you, taking care of uh, any kind of uh, needs that might uh, need looking after. So this is the whole idea of having these systems, and, and we're working on this. Uh, a lot of, lot of technologies are very close to achieving this as well, now more so than ever. Um, however, this again brings uh, in light and brings into question uh, a privacy component, which is, cross-regional and cross-border um, collaboration and alignment between different offices and different branches. So we have GDPR, which, which governs uh, the EU. We need similar principles for the rest of the world. We, we have something of a skeleton framework for the rest of the world. However, the EU has always been the front runner when it comes to privacy and driving these uh, changes from an individual privacy perspective. So this is something that needs to be taken into consideration as well and, and cross-border alignment between uh, between disparate IoT technologies. And uh, so the healthcare industry providing as an example for this. So some IoT stats, um, it is predicted by McKinsey that it is going to be roughly $11 trillion industry by uh, 2025. Um, by Gartner, we were already here in 2020. This was, I believe, a couple of years ago that they had published. Um, it would be roughly a quarter of a billion connected cars uh, by by this year, by 2020. I believe we've overachieved these um, uh, these stats. Uh, there are some, um, let's say, um, ongoing debates on ex the exact number of of what are the, the connected number of cars currently, but I believe we have we have achieved this and we've gone gone over the quarter of a billion mark. And coming to you live from Dubai, so Dubai ranks uh, as per AT Kearney, um, 28th on the Smart City Index. Uh, this is probably may have even moved up a couple of spots with uh, Dubai winning the Expo 2020 deal. Um, there are certain changes to that, of course, given the current situation, however, uh, it's amongst the top, let's say, Dubai being the front runner of uh, the Smart Cities initiative. And a moment again to talk about the privacy component. Um, having all these innovations and having all these driving forces towards uh, IoT devices and smart cities and such, we do need a model for governing these practices. And I believe the UA government already has certain um, let's say, initiatives in place to, to governing this. As of now, the best model, as I mentioned, we have is GDPR. So we may in the future have something 
uh, that resembles the GDPR uh, for regionally for, for uh, UAE. Looking at the scope, um, so the IoT industry itself, it, it can be thought of as three distinct pillars or let's say three um, uh, supersets and subsets. So the superset being uh, a government level, governing body level, smart city level IoT. Uh, at a smaller scale, we would have the home automation systems, your Google Homes, your Alexas, so on and so forth. And of course, at the individual level, we have our Fitbits and uh, and the likes, which, which are in person on, on, on your day-to-days, wearable tech. So these are the three main pillars and the privacy, privacy component that uh, needs to be considered in relation to this is having split domains and different stakeholders at each of these points. So as an organization, you want to have a uh, direct chain of custody. You want to have directly responsible uh, individuals, uh, be it from an HR background, be it from legal, be it from information security. We need a collaborative model between these divisions to drive these initiatives forward and, and, and speak the language of privacy and, and make these uh, systems at the individual as well as at the city level more secure, more safe, more usable for the individual. So I talked a bit about smart cities. So what exactly is a smart city? It's nothing but um, an entity, a city that has uh, a vast number of devices interconnected online, sharing information, sharing data with one another, sharing insights with one another, uh, and learning and growing from one another. So at the city level, uh, it could be something similar to our, our no cards. We, are, we already have this in practice. We have a lot more initiatives uh, in the pipeline that's going to be a more centralized city, one card to rule them all, kind of uh, uh, pay everything in, in a single card, have all access in this in the same card, uh, so on and so forth. Having having a city that is essentially smart. And we have initiatives uh, for this uh, in the likes of smart bands and, and wristwatches and such. And uh, as I mentioned, the no card being one of them as well. At the environment level, we as you have uh, certain initiatives for the wildlife sector as well, where we have um, set up camera traps, which, which kind of photograph endangered species and, and species that are in, in the wild. And we share this data via drones. So these speed, uh, sorry, these uh, camera traps detect motion within within the endangered species or, or, or an animal that's in motion in front of the camera. These cameras capture the image and then they have a direct drone flying over these uh, set cameras or, or the transmitting devices that's transmitting the data. And these drones collect this data for further analysis and, and send it back to uh, to the internet or, or, or the database that's doing all the analytics behind the scenes to segregate the different species by location. So we have this, we, this is all already in practice. This has all been a uh, work in progress in the last few years. At the industry level, we have a figure that's $3.8 trillion uh, worth um, the industrial IoT industry. Um, we have Honeywell as the front runners of this, where they have smart devices, smart um, reporting technologies, which, which lets you know exactly when and if your IoT um, uh, plants and your IoT devices are, are malfunctioning or there is an anomaly. You get a real time update on your smartphone or your application or, or, or a wearable device as well. This is again technology that currently exists in the market. When it comes to transportation uh, and citywide, uh, let's say smart initiatives, th there's a lot of automation in uh, regards to smart lights, uh, motion detection to save energy, uh, GPS systems being integrated into, into the metros, uh, as well as the bus systems. We have this in the bio, as part of the, the, the Metro initiative, and we have this in UK as part of their, their bus commute systems and such. And of course, a minute to reflect on centralized monitoring of data. Uh, in current times, we have a lot of initiatives, a lot of monitoring for uh, the COVID-19 pandemic situation, different applications, different um, 
devices, different solutions to try and track the members that may have been in contact with uh, with someone who had been infected. So this is HP01. This is the first ever smart watch, I want to say, but it, however, it, it wasn't an IoT device. Uh, important to mention here is that this was the first wearable computer. So this was initially uh, brought into market in the 1970s, and it was a, a calculator, uh, a watch calculator, and this is kind of the snowballing effect. This is kind of the front runners of this sort of technology based on which we, of course, have our smartwatches now, our Apples or Samsungs and so on and so forth. And of course, minute to reflect on the privacy component here, reinforcing organizational privacy policies. So as you would remember, uh, let's say the 2015s, 2014s was when the industry shifted a great deal towards BYOD, bring your own devices and uh, initiative towards uh, securing the workplace as well as giving individuals the flexibility to work on their own devices. So this is a similar platform, uh, of course, with the growing need for physical security, the growing need for biometric systems. There definitely needs to be an organizational wide privacy policy that governs these uh, sort of devices and sort of um, wearable technology that may at all times be collecting private personal data about, about you. And education and awareness is, of course, how you achieve this. A few more stats. Uh, wearable tech in the MIA region uh, estimated to be a roughly $0.3 billion industry. 20.1% uh, annual growth. And 71% basic wearables in, in, in the market currently already been introduced. And the privacy component here, of course, is to have consent by affirmative action. Uh, when, when we purchase these devices, we have a lot of um, uh, policies that we need to go through. Uh, do you accept the terms and conditions? And of course, this is on ba based on the work done by, by GDPR. This is kind of the onus has been shifted to the organizations themselves, whereas you are no longer kind of expected to go through through these long and dreary documents that that uh, that outlines exactly the things that they are allowed to do with this data. However, they are kind of uh, more in line with the people themselves. They, they need to have images, they need to have icons, they need to have things that are more concise, easy to read, easy to digest, and you can make an informed decision based on this and go ahead and uh, sign off on consent or reject on consent based on sound principles and your understanding of, of the, the use of the data being uh, being done behind the scenes. And this has to be done by affirmative action. It cannot be a pre tech box. It cannot be a pre-selected item. It has to be you as the user, you as the individual that signs off and consent and follows through on it. So some similarities and uh, dissimilarities in, in the wearables ecosystem. So they're they're all um, on on the person that they're wearable. It's in the name. So it's either on you or in essence in you. Uh, one of the first wearable tech, let's say, was was uh, in the field of prosthetics, I believe, in in the late 90s, where there was a direct implant in a uh, brain of of a blind. Uh, subject of a blind patient, and, and this enabled this implant enabled him essentially to see. This would, of course, transmit back and forth data from a camera, a mountable camera, which was, um, let's say, welded onto onto a sunglass on a pair of sunglasses, and and the patient would wear this, and this would, at a very high level, give him the ability to see, uh, not in clear vision, not not as much as. Uh, people with regular 2020, but at least good enough to navigate his way across across the world. So this was one of the first um, invasive technologies when it came to wearable um, IoT. Again, important to mention this wasn't IoT. It was technology that was wearable. However, these new forms of technologies have integrated them to be uh, available online, available constantly on the Internet. So the similarities on person or in person computing power um, 
always connected, of course, um, always sensing, collecting data, analyzing, of course, as well. And the dissimilarities, of course, come in uh, regards to their functionalities and their features, whereas the Fitbits might collect information about your sleep patterns and your heart rate. Your smart watches might be more in tune with your, uh, let's say, social platform, your Instagrams, your Facebooks, your, your messages, uh, so on and so forth. And of course, th these would be segregated by their, their features as well. So we spoke about the Fitbits. Uh, it's nice to know a kind of at a high level exactly what are the data that's been collected. So at a very high level, this is what your Fitbit can do, or at least some of the Fitbits, some of the let's say higher end Fitbits can do, uh, is count your steps, of course, uh, monitor your diet, your heart rate, your sleep patterns, your location data, your body composition, as well as your posture. So, so we can do, it has a lot of insight into the person that you are. It has a lot of data into exactly what you're doing at what time and what specific uh, place as well uh, during the day. Uh, I worked very briefly on a uh, data set as, as part of my uh, my research in, in analytics uh, on, on a data set called PAMAP, which was physical activity mon monitoring which was essentially a means of uh, getting the time series data that's been collected on these devices. At the time, it wasn't Fitbits, and at the time it wasn't wearables as such. I mean, it was wearables, but they were kind of patches that you had to um, uh, stick onto the subject and then uh, do your analysis offline on the, on the time series that's being generated from these people. Different, of course, as you would Imagine for a person walking, different for a person sleeping, sitting, and so on and so forth, with the intention of uh, classifying the part of the time series that is responsible for a specific activity. So we have this insight, and, and this was work done, mind you, like upwards of six years ago, five, six years ago, or, or around the time. So this has been around and done for a very, very long time. So this can be done now. Like your Fitbits have the ability to tell exactly when you're sleeping. Uh, at any point in time. Smart watches kind of have the similar uh, similar abilities as well. It's, it's think of it as a, a Fitbit, an advanced Fitbit, because it has all these uh, data uh, intakes as well. It, it can definitely collect the, the data inputs, as I mentioned, from the Fitbits, as well as more information, direct information to your social media platform, as well as your emails, your calls, your texts. Uh, your app usage, you name it. It has full access. This is administrator. This is individual administrator. So it has full access. So very important to keep in mind uh, the privacy components of your smartwatches and uh, the likes of the data subject access requests, again, brought to you uh, thanks to GDPR, where the individual is, is in control. You, you call the shots as to what can be shared, when you want your data taken offline, so on and so forth. And uh, if you would have um, attempted to deactivate or, or successfully deactivated your Facebook or your social media accounts, you now have the ability to get a full acquisition. You, you can just go on and click and, and it's very easy to find and uh, request Facebook to hand over your data to you, um, delete it, uh, move it over to Google. I don't know, you, you have, you call the shots. You can do this and, and, and they are obligated by law, by, by regulation to do this for you which is again a great point to mention that power to the people. A minute to look at kind of the disparate technologies when it comes to alternative reality. We have two forms, uh, currently VR and AR, virtual reality and augmented reality. Very, very um, subtle distinctions between the two. Uh, virtual, re virtual reality is more gaming oriented. It's more towards the gaming industry and focusing on things that aren't reality, that aren't uh, essentially part of the, the reality that we perceive. Augmented reality, however, builds on top of the physical world itself, such as recognizing faces, seeing the road, uh, giving you uh, information on people, so on and so forth, as you would have seen uh, the likes of the Google Glass and Microsoft and so on.
So what are kind of the applications of alternative reality? Uh, we have a lot of uh, impact on, on the medical industry, uh, as well as currently in autom automated driving and such. Uh, in the medical field, I, I work not in the medical field, but briefly from a research perspective uh, on, on Da Vinci surgical systems where th there were sensors mounted onto um, uh, surgical equipment. And this would kind of draw out a uh, time series based on the movements that the surgeon per surgeon performs on these uh, surgical devices. And then it gives you a neat kind of uh, data on exactly what were the movements, where did he go left, where did he go right, what are the kind of movements that he made on it, the, the incisors uh, being used, and so on and so forth, with the intention of uh, doing some analytics on these time series and figuring out who is a good, more experienced professional, more experienced surgeon and who might need more work and who might need to uh, uh, learn better, let's say. So this was kind of work done previously and we have this in terms of uh, virtual reality as well as augmented reality, remote surgeries being one of the applications as well, doctors in Germany performing surgeries in uh, Sweden and so on and so forth. And we have this similar augmented reality technologies in, in our uh, uh, cars currently as well, which gives you an estimated distance and, and stopping breaking distance between the car in front of you. So ingestibles, uh, we have similar IoT devices for that can be ingested as well in the person, as I, as I mentioned previously, in the body itself to monitor vitals, monitor your, your uh, health status, let's say and give you a, a real time minute by minute, second by second uh, information on, on your blood pressure, heart rate, blood sugar, so on and so forth. And this brings up a lot of interesting ethical questions when it comes to um, uh, schizophrenic patients and who holds uh, their rights and who, who who is in charge of their data essentially. Because someone with schizophrenia having a psychotic attack would no longer be the individual in control of their decision. So if the person had written off on consent prior to having an episode, prior to having a psychotic um, uh, interaction, he may have signed off on consent and after the, the episode, they may withdraw consent. So who really is in charge of the data? So th this brings, brings up a lot of uh, interesting ethical perspectives uh, to the table, which we are yet to answer from a privacy perspective. So the current state of uh, IT, uh, you name it, uh, social media being a huge form of um, collection. It's the master data set, let's say. It knows everything about our, our patterns, our, our profiles, the kind of person that we are, our buying habits, our, our, our salary bracket, you name it. It's, it's all there. Just a matter of um, typing in the right SQL query, let's say. It's all in there. It's all on, uh, on, on Facebook, on the, on the mainstream media. Emergent technologies, we have the, the Fitbits that I talked about, drones, smart cars, automation and driving, smart industries, uh, et cetera. And yet to be implemented more at the smart city level, smart transportation and such, the Hyperloop, uh, aerial taxis and drones and so on and so forth. So, all these data, all, all of this information that's been created by us and shared freely um, with the social media and different banks and different accounts and different platforms, these have a direct impact on human life. Needless to say that, that your financial data has some intrinsic value to it, not just some intrinsic value, but some monetary value to it. And, and, and your personal data, your profile, your, your posts that you may have shared, your, your private messages that you may have uh, engaged in, uh, definitely has an intrinsic value assigned to it and it has a direct impact on, on your lives. So it is very essential, it's very important that we look at these challenges and we kind of um, focus on bringing together different divisions and different stakeholders and aligning our goals into the same uh, same outset and, and having a more secure, more robust platform for the individual as well as at an organizational level. So anyone from information security, the, the core of IS, 
the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Again, all of this has a direct impact on, on human life as well. It is now more important than ever to secure your system, to secure your, your, your IT devices, your, your um, mobile phones, your wearable, anything, anything with technology embedded on it needs to inherently have security by design principles uh, attached to it. And the privacy component that this would fall in line with is of course training and user awareness and letting people know exactly what kind of impact each of these individual systems may have and driving training in initiatives in line with these uh, said impacts and having them in a form that is digestible, having numbers associated to it, having clear targets as to the number of trainings you want to do. If you want to do uh, an email campaign, uh, security against phishing, you need to have a clear number on how many phishing emails, on how, how frequently you want to do this, and, and the number of people that would be uh, subject to this, uh, to this training initiative. And of course, the people responsible for these processes themselves, the, the, the owners of them. The, your DPOs would be the likely candidate working together with your HR as well as your financial department, so on and so forth. And of course, IT has a role to play in this as well because everything is technology. Security in the IoT, so covering these three aspects, making it inherent, holistic, and measurable would cover most of your ground. You need to have all these three, uh, let's say, core principles embedded into anything that is IoT, and it should not come as a surprise that we have so many different di disparate forms of IoT devices and technologies that it is one of the weakest forms of technology we have currently. It's, it's just securing this is an immense challenge because just because of the sheer number of different um, varieties of devices that you have online. So considering security by design, uh, keeping all components and all layers in mind, designing security at all levels, right from your hardware all the way up to your applications. And of course, having it measurable, having standards and compliance models to measure your security uh, posture against. So let's take the example of a self-driving car. Uh, we'll go over the points, the inherent holistic and measurable points with the self-driving car in mind. And of course, when you think of a self-driving car, these are kind of the four components that's definitely gonna be uh, embedded in the system. Your location, definitely, you need to know where you are to know where you wanna get. Your speed, uh, weather conditions and spatial awareness, of course, which way you're facing, the car alignment, etc. Keeping that in mind, to have an inherently secure self-driving car, these are the four main principles that we need to keep in mind, and these are the four main principles that the people designing the cars should focus on, uh, having a, an inherent security principle in, in position. So security over functionality, we cannot stress this enough. There are several ethical and um, uh, process challenges when it comes to functionality as to who is who owns, let's say, the ethical ownership in the event that the car malfunctions and has uh, is on collision course with with a pedestrian. Who takes over? Does the car in fact swerve? Does the car in fact do nothing? These are some of the inherent ethical questions that are, arise from a self-driving car. So we need to have security at the core of it all uh, without letting functionality take over. So the security is going to be the primary concern uh, in regards to an inherently secure self-driving car. Secure application development, of course, following standards and following principles and having your organization um, certified in, in uh, SDLC and, and secure mechanisms of developing software is a great start. Principle of least privilege, this rings true for any system that, that embeds technology in it. You only want to give the systems just the right amount of access uh, at the time that they need it, and no more and no less. And input validation um, to avoid any kind of uh, remote code execution or any kind of uh, existing attack vectors and, and building your security around um, having some basic security principles around uh, validation. 
the holistic approach in a, in, in a self-driving car. So this is everything, uh, essentially, not everything, but in my best effort, everything that you can think of that you need to integrate into your development of a self-driving car. Uh, it's it's a heterogeneous universe of things, so no two things are similar. So in in the car in in Tesla, you may have uh, braking systems and braking computers from. I don't know, it could be uh, Indonesia, it could be India, it could be China, Malaysia, etc. Different components coming from different parts of the world with different vendors and different technologies associated to it. So no two technologies are the same, no two things are the same. And of course, securing these two things is no menial task. Of course, it needs to be under one umbrella. The security systems needs to have a single platform for securing all these disparate technologies under one umbrella. Monitoring, of course, how we would secure this, how we would handle false positives, how we would handle the alerts. This is again, something very basic and high level that the designers need to consider and, and embed into their development process. And uh, finally, last but not the least, OWASP following open source um, web application security processes for developing the software and including device, the cloud, the, the holistic approach, including all of these single components into um, the grander design. And measurable, we don't currently, this is sort of why the IoT technology is still kind of struggling to keep up with the current needs of security is because we don't have a standard. We don't have a de facto uh, a PCI DSS or, or something something that can be implemented in the IoT domain. And this is work in progress. This isn't something that is not being looked at. It's definitely work in progress is definitely being developed. However, we don't have something as of now currently available in market. And this is again needs to be in place and we need to focus our, our efforts towards it being measurable and having sort of a benchmark of comparing IoT device security with existing, uh, uh, let's say, industry best practices since we don't have uh, a security standard for this. Finally, uh, I, I spoke about all these different forms. I spoke about all these different um, domains, data domains, all of these data being collected from a disparate uh, domains and different technologies, your wearables, your social media, your smartphone, so on. And, and all these data are, are easily available. This is a few clicks away and Google search is a way that's readily available. So it is now more than ever crucial to have these discussions and design the conversations that we have with every single team around privacy, around securing at the individual level and, and considering questions such as who owns the, the, the personally identifiable information, who's the controller, who is the processor, uh, the flow of data, where is the data being shared, where is the data coming from, what is the need for having this data to be shared, so on and so forth. Uh, and these are all kind of um, core and, and essential questions to be uh, addressed in this current market. And, and, and of course, the other ones follow as well, who approves data sharing and the right to be forgotten, as, as I mentioned from, from your social media, your, your Microsoft, et cetera, any, any account that you might have uh, should have these principles already in place, or if not already in place, should already be in pipeline and work in progress to have these basic uh, um, rights handed over to the individual. That's it from me, guys. Thank you so much for joining. I hope this was an informative and insightful session for you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop it on the chat section here. I will be here for a couple more minutes.
OK, I see the chat section is clear. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate you being on this session. It's been a pleasure hosting you. Have a great rest of the day. Take care and be safe. Thank you again.